Hello, everyone. This is Clayton K. Han Lust. This is U.S. History 1302, Lecture 3, the 1890s uh, Race and Fundamental Change. Uh, the 1890s is a really important period for the United States. It is a period of absolute fundamental change uh, in our nation's course. Uh, it's literally a matter of one era ending and a new era beginning. Uh, we see all sorts of different things happening in the 1890s. For example, in 1890, the subjugation of Native Americans came to an end uh, with the massacre of Lakota Indians at a place called Wounded Knee Creek in South Dakota. In 1893, the United States Census Department is going to declare following the 1890 census that every inch of the United States is settled. Now, they don't literally mean every inch is settled, that there are people occupying every inch of space in the United States. What they mean is, is that the continental United States from Atlantic to Pacific, everything that makes up the area that we own is actually controlled by the United States, as opposed to certain parts being controlled by the US, other parts being dominated by Native Americans, other parts maybe being dominated uh, by uh, other groups of people. So the point is that everything is now under the control of the United States government. As we saw in the last lecture, in 1896, we see the defeat of the Populist Party, uh, the largest challenge to corporate capitalism in the United States is met and it is defeated. We also see in 1896, the Supreme Court is going to institutionalize segregation within our system. In 1898, the United States is going to be recognized as a world power. And then in the 1890s, we're also going to see the birth of the masses. Uh, we're going to see the mo modern corporation develop we're going to see modern mass media. We're going to see all sorts of changes within mass consumption. Indeed, the modern era is going to begin in 1890. Now, to see how we got there, we've got to, we're going to first look at one of the big things that's happening in the 1890s, and that is how racial relations are changing. Racial violence was a big part of the last uh, lecture. We talked about lynching. We talked about all sorts of other things uh, with regard to African Americans. But see how we got to a point of violence here. We've got to see what the uh, life uh, for African Americans was like starting in the 1890s, at the, condi the conditions at the turn of the century. For African Americans, there was not a whole lot of change in the United States uh, following. Uh, the Civil War. Uh, and for African Americans, uh, it seemed like very little uh, was, was different. 90% of all African Americans lived in the South at the turn of the century. Now, the turn of the century represents 35 years from the end of the Civil War. So overwhelmingly, African Americans still lived in the South. The average life expectancy for the African American community was 33 years. That's compared to 47 uh, in the 1890s and 57 at the turn of the century. Even though slavery had been over for three plus decades by 1900, most African Americans in this country were farm laborers, meaning that from the standpoint of what they did day to day for a living, they're doing the same thing as they did in the era of slavery. And most African Americans, the overwhelming majority, owned no land, just like during the era of slavery. Three fourths of all African Americans were sharecroppers. Now, the African American population in total was about 13 million in 1900. So, 13 million, you take 90% of that population, it's situated in the South. And of that 13 million, 75% were sharecroppers. This is why I said in a previous class, this is what people refer to when they're talking about something affecting people disproportionately. No one would ever argue that there were not black share, or excuse me, that there were only black sharecroppers. Obviously, there were white sharecroppers as well, but the problems of sharecropping affected African Americans in a disproportionate way. Now, we also see that African Americans were being uh, deprived of access to education. Uh, 
in the United States. To give you just a couple of examples of that, in South Carolina, the state of South Carolina spent $12 on white education for every $1 that they spent on black education. Uh, in North Carolina, in the entire state of North Carolina in 1916, there were a total of 19 African Americans enrolled in high schools. This speaks to the problem of access to education. There simply isn't a moment in the lives of black folks during this period where they see relevance in education. And if the state is not spending money, if the state is not putting equal money into this process, many African American parents are simply saying there's no point uh, in sending our children to school. However, the big change, remember this is an era of fundamental change, the big change that's happening here is that in the 1890s, the African-American community is going to be stripped of their citizenship. Uh, they're stripped of their citizenship rights in this country. It's going to be the culmination of a two decades long process where African-Americans are going to be brought to second class citizenship in this country. Now, it's not a moment where we see people getting together and saying, uh, you know, these people are this group of people is no longer citizens. They're going to be more subtle than this. It's going to be an active effort to deprive African Americans of doing the things that an average American citizen actually does. So let's look at some of the ways that this was ingrained in American society. The first way it was done was through something called the convict lease system. Uh, in the South, governments started doing uh, the convict lease system. Uh, there were all sorts of efforts, as we talked about in the first lecture, to uh, cut government spending. And if governments weren't going to spend money on public schooling, they certainly weren't going to spend money on paying for prisons. The states were getting spending down to a bare, bare minimum. And in 1880, the state of Alabama came up with a new revenue source and a new way to make sure they didn't have to spend money on the issues of prisons. In 1880, Alabama began leasing their convicts to private businesses. They leased so many convicts out to private business owners that 73% of all of Alabama's state revenue came from the convict lease system. Now today, if you had to guess, I would hope that most of you would guess that the bulk of a state's revenue comes from taxes. Okay, or something like that. But here in the 1880s, or in 1880, 73% of Alabama's revenue is coming from convict lease. It is literally a matter of, it is not only paying for the prison system, but it's paying for virtually everything else in the state. Now, the question of who you lease or who the state is leasing these convicts to, well, they're leasing them to uh, politicians that uh, own uh, large swaths of land or have interests in uh, public improvement programs, the northern agribusinesses that have developed through this era, this era well, uh, contractors, all sorts of things. Uh, those are the types of businesses that are coming in and requesting to lease convicts. Most of these people who are going to be leased out to private individuals uh, were working in mines and on plantations. They were uh, growing a lot of the nation's food and a lot of the nation's cotton uh, and raw materials, uh, just like we see in the private prison system today. Uh, and also, most of the convicts were African Americans. Here we're going to deal with that question of disproportionality again. In every single state, with one exception in the South, every single state, the convicts were overwhelmingly African-American, meaning 60% plus. The sole exception to this was Texas. And in Texas, it was a what we would call a majority as opposed to an overwhelming majority here. So in virtually every state, the largest number of convicts were African-Americans. So for many people, this was, a again, a, que a question of it affecting the African-American population disproportionately. And it's easy to see how a system like this would actually get put in place. As I mentioned, we're talking about states that are broke, that don't have revenue coming in, that are saying we don't want to spend money and we're not going to spend money. So we're going to take advantage of this one resource. Now, 
given that it was providing all of this revenue to these states, and given that it was overwhelmingly African-American convicts that were providing this labor, there were a lot of advocates in the 1870s, or excuse me, in the 1880s, who were arguing that this was a system of, quote, virtual re-enslavement, a system of virtual re-enslavement. Why virtual re-enslavement? Why are they even using the words slavery or putting that whole idea out there? Well, it's very simple. The 13th Amendment had theoretically banned the institution of slavery in the United States. The 13th Amendment reads as follows, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Now, that may seem straightforward, but it's not. There is a giant glaring loophole in there. It does not, the 13th Amendment does not end slavery under all circumstances. It leaves that big exception in there, except as slip punishment for slavery, where of the part where of the party shall have been duly convicted. And this is the loophole Southerners use to quote unquote virtually re-enslave their populations. And their position at every single one of the states that employed convict lease, the position was that no matter how minor the crime a person was convicted of, no matter what time they had left on their sentence, no matter how violent. The person was, if they were a convict, they were subject to convict lease. They could be leased out to these private places. There were no limits to the laws, or excuse me, to the hours that the convicts would work. There were no limits to the type of work that convicts performed. And also, because of the state's view of convict labor, there was virtually no responsibility for the health of these convicts. If a person had, was working these convicts and the, one of the convicts happened to die, the state simply looked at it as, well, we're not going to press any charges. We're not going to go after that person for depriving that person of life. We're just going to look at it as one less mouth to feed going forward. So people were not punished for this sort of stuff. The, uh, the use of convict labor uh, justified the maltreatment of other convicts. Uh, it was considered a matter of uh, coercive punishment when all of the convicts would be used in a, uh, in a labor setting. Uh, for example, in Arkansas and Alabama, convicts worked in lead mines even in the winter uh, period. Uh, this meant that they were in mines with a lot of standing water during col the colder months of the, the year. They would be out there without shoes uh, and they would suffer all sorts of problems from frostbite uh, to exposure. And then on top of that, the people that were in control were permitted uh, to use whatever punishments they saw fit. And these people punished all of the criminals if one criminal failed to mine the required amount or if one of the criminals uh, act, or one of the convicts, excuse me, uh, actually uh, did something that was considered uh, uh, mis uh, misbehaving or something along those lines. So all convicts could be punished uh, for these types of actions. Now, ultimately, uh, the laws changed uh, heading into the 20th century. Uh, for example, one of the provisions changed uh, that convicts could actually be sublet if a person had leased out a certain number of convicts from the prison and decided, oh, well, I don't have enough work for them. They could actually sublet them to another uh, corporate interest. That sort of stuff stopped uh, in, heading into the 20th century. Uh, but the 20th century, the big change that happens uh, in the 1920s is that convict lease is going to end from the standpoint of the prison can uh, lease out the convicts. But the convicts are still going to be employed uh, in this sort of involuntary labor by the creation of private prisons, meaning, meaning prisons that carry out the state's functions to punish convicts, but they're owned by private entities. And then on top of that, the prisons themselves uh, will take over the functions uh, as contractors. For example, if a, uh, if a state had uh, pretty fertile ground for growing uh, cotton, for example, uh, 
uh, the st a state penitentiary might be involved in the business uh, of growing cotton. So they simply take over the contractor functions uh, that these private businesses had been doing uh, up to this point. But it is absolutely being used as a way to deprive African Americans of their rights as citizens. Now, a another issue that we see is the issue of racial segregation. Before apartheid ever existed in South Africa, it existed right here in the United States. The first state to legally adopt segregation was Florida in 1887. And eventually all states did, uh, did this, adopting the use of separate schools, separate bus, uh, separate rail cars, eventually separate buses, uh, separate bathrooms, drinking fountains, hotel rooms, and on and on. Anything that could be segregated was segregated. Now, What's interesting, or I think odd about all of this stuff is, as I mentioned at the top, this doesn't happen right after the Civil War. Segregation in the United States does not start in 1865. It starts in 1887. And it's not a coincidence that segregation laws start cropping up at the same time that the populists who had integrated their party and were calling for all of these sorts of changes in the United States. It's no accident that race is used to, to drive a wedge within the populist party and stop uh, their rise to power. Ultimately, uh, what we see here is a change in the process of segregation. We see a change from de facto segregation, which was what had existed before, it was a matter of, it's just a, it's just a matter of custom that certain people don't live in this area and other people live over here or however you wanna conceptualize segregation in your mind. It's de facto, it's by custom. But by 1896, it's now what's referred to as de jure segregation, meaning that the laws encapsulate segregation, okay? So the populists play an indirect role in all of this stuff by appealing to the broader problems of the overall economy they're saying, look, everybody, white and black, has a similar problem here. And what we all need to do is band together against the common enemy. Well, Southern Democrats are going to come in and use waste, race as a wedge issue to divide Southern farmers. Now, the key moment in all of this, the key moment in getting uh, segregation uh, institutionalized in the United States is, the, is a major Supreme Court case called the Plessy versus Ferguson case. In 1890, Louisiana adopted a law stipulating separate rail cars for African-American and for white riders. Now they didn't literally say this car is for black riders, this car is for white riders. They said that there was a regular ticket that a person could purchase and there is a first class ticket that a person could purchase. And African-Americans were, for, were forbidden from purchasing first class tickets. So that's how they instituted this law. They also put in part of the end of this law, a provision called the one drop rule, meaning that no matter how much African ancestry a person had, if they had quote unquote one drop of African-American blood or ancestry, then they were considered black by law and they could not ride a first class car. Now in 1892, Homer Plessy pictured on the screen purchased one of these first class railroad seats. Now you can see by looking at Homer Plessy, he's very light skinned. He engaged in something that was called passing during this era, uh, meaning that he presented himself uh, as white when the circumstances necessitated it. So he purchased his first class ticket got on, these, on his train, gave the conductor his ticket, uh, and then uh, was immediately arrested for violating the law because he was actually African-American. Now, make no mistake about all of this, <coughs> excuse me, Homer Plessy was on that train that day to get arrested. This wasn't some sort of a coincidence. He was there to get arrested because you get arrested, you can challenge the actual law. Now, Louisiana's court held 
that this law was legitimate, that their, their, their appellate courts said that the law did not violate the Constitution of the United States. And finally, by 1896, the case reached the U.S. Supreme Court. And in the case, Plessy versus Ferguson, the court ruled eight to one that the law segregating railroad cars was in fact constitutional. They argued, they held, I shouldn't say they argued, they held that the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution did not invalidate segregation. This is what Plessy and his attorneys were arguing, was that the 14th Amendment forbid segregation. And here's why. The 14th Amendment had an equal, what's called the Equal Protection Clause. And it says the following, quote, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or process property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Meaning, the laws apply equally to everyone. So if that's the case, segregation is not legitimate. What the courts held here was a doctrine called the separate but equal doctrine. As long as the facilities are in fact equal, then they can be separated. There's no reason why segregation cannot actually take place. Now I note that it's an eight to one ruling. That means there was one dissent in this case. And the one dissent was a guy named John Marshall Harlan. And on the next screen, you're going to see a big block of words. I don't want you to take down the, the word, the block quote. I don't want you to take notes on it or anything. I just want you to listen to it because it's a fairly impactful statement. The person who wrote the one dissenting view was a guy named John Marshall Harlan. John Marshall Harlan was from Kentucky. He was from a slave owning family. And when the Civil War happened, his family was a Union family. So they fought on the side of the Union. But John Marshall Harlan became an attorney, became a judge, and he opposed Abraham Lincoln. He opposed the, uh, he, uh, I, when I say he opposed Abraham Lincoln, I mean uh, he opposed Lincoln uh, and his ideas about slavery. He opposed the Emancipation Proclamation, but he did believe in Union. Okay. So when the Civil War was over, John Marshall Harlan essentially said, well, the war's over, slavery's done with, that's that, that's just the realities of the circumstances. So he wrote the following dissent. Remember, a slaveholder who opposed the Emancipation Proclamation wrote the following dissent. He wrote, quote, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. The arbitrary separation of citizens on the basis of race while they are on a public highway is a badge of servitude wholly inconsistent with the civil freedom and the equality before the law established by the Constitution. It cannot be justified upon any legal grounds. What can more certainly arouse race hate? What can more certainly create and perpetuate a feeling of distrust between these races than state enactments which in fact proceed on the ground that colored citizens are so inferior and degraded that they cannot be allowed to sit in public coaches occupied by white citizens? That, as all will admit, is the real meaning of such legislation. So John Marshall Harlan got it. He understood the problem. He understood what was at question and what was at issue here. And he understood the solution. But unfortunately, he's only one person on the court during this period. And the ruling of Plessy versus Ferguson have, happening in 1896 is going to stand for the next 58 years. It's not going to be until 1954 that the Supreme Court undoes this ruling. Now, incidentally, even though this ruling is specifically about railroad cars, 
states now had a precedent to declare separate but equal in every aspect of life. They saw it as a green light, green light to segregate everything. So almost immediately, Alabama started segregating hospitals. They segregated mental facilities. They segregated elderly homes. Uh, Flor the state of Florida mandated that school books for white and black children not only be separated so that African-American kids and white kids are not using the same school books, they mandated that they be stored in separate buildings so there's no possibility of them being switched up or intermingled. In Louisiana, they took the ruling a step further. They said, we're not only going to not allow black and white rail car riders to be on the same cars. They said the ticket windows by law had to be 25 feet apart. So there was no chance that black riders could get in the quote unquote wrong line uh, and that whites didn't have to mingle in the same lines with black riders. In South Carolina, the textile industry uh, enacted, uh, got the state legislature to enact separate rooms for textile workers in that state. And virtually every state across the United States joined in and passed some form of segregation laws requiring separate baseball fields, separate swimming pools, separate water fountains, separate restrooms, and on and on and on. But the most vigorous way in which segregation was pursued and this sort of uh, discrimination against African-Americans was pursued was in the area of voting rights or what we call disfranchisement or sometimes people call it disenfranchisement. Both, both words literally mean the same thing. So it doesn't matter to me which word you use. The, once again, the uh, constitution is the big question here. The Constitution in the 15th Amendment stated that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Now, that's the wording, but again, big loophole in the middle of this stuff. It says you cannot deny the right to vote on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So as long as you don't use race, color, or previous condition of servitude, you can still discriminate. A state can still say, you do not have the right to vote. So think about things like, for example, women being allowed to vote. If I were to ask you in person, if I were to say, does this protect the rights of women to vote? You should all be shaking your head. No, it does not because the right to vote cannot be denied on the account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. But gender is okay. You can discriminate on the basis of gender. You can discriminate theoretically on the basis of religion because it's not race, color, or previous condition of servitude. You can theoretically discriminate on the basis of land ownership because it's not race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So as long as it doesn't come down to a condition of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, it can, be, it can be applied here. Now, these are the, this is the loophole, again, that the South uses to disenfranchise African-American voters. And the first way they do it is in what's called the Mississippi Plan. Now, Mississippi Plan isn't literally a plan where Mississippians got together and said, all right, here's what we're going to do didn't do that. This is something that evolved over the process of the 1870s. And ultimately, every state wound up uh, enacting uh, to various degrees uh, this entire idea. But again, the whole plan is to eliminate African-American voters from the voting pool. Now, the first part of this, the first way to do this, Mississippi put in place something called a poll tax. In 1875, uh, when Republicans won the bulk of state offices, uh, the Democratic Party, which was still in control in a lot of local areas, said, well, we got to make sure that this doesn't happen again. So starting in the 1876 elections, voters are going to have to pay a small tax in order to vote. Now, the beauty, if you will, for segregationists is, is that this doesn't have to be a big tax because you're dealing with overwhelmingly impoverished people. So even a small tax 
is going to hurt them. And if you do things like say the tax accrues as a, as a manner of, of policy, well, then if you've got the taxes to pay, you can pay the tax in say 1877, but you couldn't pay it in 1876. Well, you've got to pay 1876's tax before you can pay 1877's and you can vote. So the tax is small because you're dealing with poor people and it accrues. Now, the problem for these people who are trying to do this, we're going to see this uh, even to an even greater extent in the literacy test, is that because it's poor people and poor is not about race, it, it hits a lot of poor whites. Poor whites aren't able to pay this poll tax. Now, the next thing that winds up getting put in place is something called the literacy test. The literacy test is an exam. In that a person has to pass, given by the registrars, the person who says, all right, what's your name, your date of birth, all that sort of stuff when they register you to vote. The registrar asks these questions. They're fairly simple, fundamental questions. But if you don't have a rudimentary education, they're going to be very difficult to pass. So, you know, it's questions like, you know, what are your rights in front of a grand jury? Uh, where do electors meet uh, to cast the ballots for the electoral college, which is all stuff that's basic common knowledge, but again, not if you don't have real access to education. Again, because of this, a lot of poor whites who don't have access to basic good education, they're also getting ensnared by the poll tax and the literacy test. And Southern Democrats look at this and say, this is having the exact opposite effect. It is decreasing the black voter population, but it's also decreasing the white population, the white voter population, which we don't want. So as a corollary to all of this stuff, they add in these Southern Democrats who create the Mississippi plan, they add in something called the grandfather clause. Now the grandfather clause is a very specific law. I want you to pay attention as I tell you what the grandfather clause stated. Grandfather clause said that if a person's grandfather could vote prior to January 1st, 1870, that's the date uh, that there were big changes in Mississippi's electoral process that allowed black people to vote in the state. If your grandfather could vote before January 1st, 1870, then you were exempt from the literacy test. You don't have to take the literacy test. So it says, essentially, it doesn't literally say this. It says that all white people are safe. They don't have to take the literacy test because before January 1st, 1870, every single white person in the state of Mississippi, they were able to vote. Their grandfathers could vote, but African-Americans could not. African-Americans were not permitted prior to vote prior to that so any person who happened to be black in Mississippi in 1870, their grandfather was, un, was unable to vote. Therefore, they were going to have to pass that literacy test. Remember, the grandfather clause does not state anything about voting. It just says you don't have to take the literacy test in order to qualify to vote. Okay, that's a very important distinction here. Now, as bad as these were, and as much as they actually affected African-Americans, I'm not gonna let the North off the hook on this one. The North used these same tactics to deny immigrants the right to vote and, the, and immigrants access to the ballot box at the local and state level. Now, the big question would then be, well, how effective are these things? Well, let's look at one particular election uh, to be clear about it. In 1896, the state of Louisiana had 130,000 African-Americans cast ballots. In 1898, which is considered, quote unquote, an off-year election, it's the year they have congressional, we have congressional elections and that sort of thing, a state would expect to see a, dec a decline in the voter population. They might even see as severe a drop as only 10% of the voters came back to vote in that election. But what we see in Louisiana is only 1% returning. 
Just over 1,300 African Americans voted in the 1898 election. So this had wiped out 98% plus of the black electorate in Louisiana. So it's incredibly effective in knocking out black voters. So the question is, what do you do? What do African Americans do to fight back? And they do actually fight back in a number of ways. There's three basic ways that we're going to deal with. And one of them we're really not going to, to deal with very much uh, right now. But the three basic ways to respond to segregation were accommodation, confrontation, and separatism. Accommodation, confrontation, and separatism. Now, I'm going to spoil the surprise here on separatism. We're not going to talk about it very much right now. It's exactly what it sounds like. Like It promotes African-Americans to separate from the broader society and to create a Black enclave within the United States. But it's not very popular in the 1890s. It becomes incredibly popular in the 1920s. It becomes incredibly popular in the 1960s. So when we get to those eras, we'll talk about it more. But here, all you need to know is really is that it exists. That's it. The two we're going to be talking about for the most part are accommodation and confrontation, because those are the two big ones, accommodation and confrontation. Now, prior to 1895, the most visible leader and advocate for African-Americans in this country was Frederick Douglass. And if you've taken 1301, you should very well know who Frederick Douglass was. He was a former slave who escaped from Maryland in the 1830s, uh, was a very prominent abolitionist speaker. But he dies in 1895, and this left a void in the African-American community. A lot of people were wondering who was going to step up and be kind of the, le the leader for the community. And this brought Booker T. Washington, pictured on the screen, to the public eye. And for the next 20 years, generally speaking, Booker T. Washington was considered to be the leader of the African-American community. He ran a school called the Tuskegee Institute, uh, which taught students manual labor skills. Uh, in fact, you're going to be reading about the Tuskegee Institute uh, when you read Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery this semester. Uh, it not only taught students manual labor and vocational schools, uh, he came to the forefront of the community because of a speech he gave in Atlanta in 1895 uh, before an Atlanta Cotton Fair and Exposition. And this speech became known as the Atlanta Compromise Speech. In it, he encouraged African Americans to stay out of politics. He said, be patient and accommodate white demands for second-class citizenship. He said, don't fight all of this stuff. Stay out of politics, don't argue, don't agitate, don't mobilize, just wait. He said, pursue vocational training instead of traditional education, traditional college educations. He argued that by opposing segregation, and pursue, or excuse me, in not opposing segregation, and by pursuing economic self improvement as opposed to intellectual self improvement, that what would happen is the African American community would prove themselves to be economically indispensable to the broader community, to the white community, if you want to think of it in those sorts of terms. Once the white community understands that African Americans are a critical part of the overall economy, Washington rationalized, then they would have no choice but to grant African-Americans, quote unquote, equal civil rights. So it is not a now oriented movement. Accommodation is very clearly future oriented. Washington is saying, wait, be patient, accommodate, and equality will come, okay? Now, this got him a lot of enemies, both within, uh, particularly within the African American community. A lot of African Americans were saying, you know, forget this stuff. We need to fight back. We need to challenge this uh, attack on our equality. And that's where the confrontationist movement comes in. The confrontationist movement was led by a guy named W. E.B. 
Du Bois, William Edgar Burghardt Du Bois. Now, Du Bois was a PhD from Harvard University, unlike Booker T. Washington. I mean, Washington's autobiography is called Up From Slavery. So he was a former slave. Du Bois was not born into slavery, but he was born into the Reconstruction era and saw, uh, saw some discrimination. Although, as he put it, he really didn't see a, a ton of that discrimination until he went to college in the South. But what he saw in the North was enough that he said, accommodation is, quote unquote, capitulation to evil. It's just giving in to those who are carrying out evil actions. The only way to defeat segregation, he said, was through protest and agitation. Du Bois, along with 39 other people, created something called the Niagara Movement. And this Niagara Movement was kind of the polar opposite of what Washington was calling for in terms of accommodation. He argued that vocational education was, quote unquote, a farce that what needed to happen is that the African-American community needed intellectual development as well as economic development. He said, uh, for example, that the most exceptional within the African-American community, a group he identified as the talented 10th, he said these people should be encouraged from an intellectual standpoint. They should be sent to college. They should get a traditional education, because what they're going to do is they will form the vanguard of a black intellectual elite and ultimately, quote, lead the community out of the darkness of intellectual instability. So vocational education is not the answer. Now, ultimately, he decided that the Niagara movement was becoming too much of an accommodationist body. So he leaves the Niagara movement. And in 1909, he helps, along with the previously mentioned Ida B. Wells, create the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And this whole idea replaces the Niagara movement. They're going to agitate. Obviously, as I mentioned before, they're going to agitate for an anti-lynching law, but they're also ultimately going to move into other areas of attacking discrimination. And they're going to argue, instead of accommodating white demands, they're going to argue that the laws are on the books and that the laws need to be respected and enforced, period. Now, it's easy today, uh, as many historians have, it's easy to criticize Booker T. Washington. There was a big debate within the, uh, within the history community about whose ideas were right. Was Washington right? Was Du Bois right? And we kind of go through these peaks and valleys where uh, at times people have argued Du Bois was right. At times others have argued that Washington was right. Um, but now there's kind of a consensus among historians that both of these ideas were necessary. Uh, that Washington was coming from an era where he saw a lot of people being lynched for trying to become too intellectually oriented, for trying to challenge the status quo and agitate for equality. So this idea of accommodation not only created a blueprint for economic success, it also kept people from being lynched. Okay, Du Bois didn't see a ton of lynching in the North. He had grown up in the North and had not really seen a ton of this stuff. So as many people argued, it was easy for Du Bois to agitate for this sort of stuff. It never really directly affected him. But where most historians are today is that if you look at both confrontation and accommodation, they're both two separate paths, okay? But where they're heading is the same intersection point. And that intersection point is assimilation, integration within to the broader society. Accommodationists may be taking a separate path from confrontationists, but eventually those two paths are going to cross. Those two paths are going to merge with one another. Okay. That's where we're going to stop this particular lecture. Lecture four, we're going to be moving on to the destruction of Native Americans in the West, uh, and we'll be picking up with some really big uh, changes in the structure of the United States uh, from uh, not only socially, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, inventiveness and our, change, uh, our changing role uh, globally. So please come back for lectures uh, four, five, and six. And we'll see you next time.